Welcome everybody to the Green Spoon podcast and today we're really excited to have Michelle Ascot with us. Today we're going to be talking about setting intentions, work-life balance, mental health and the tools that can help us all live a slightly less stressful life, hopefully. Um, so Michelle, would you like to start by introducing yourself? Brilliant. So I'm really happy to be here. Thank you. I think it's fantastic that you're running these podcasts to inform the community. Um, and in terms of me, I, I have many hats, um, but in terms of the hat that I'm wearing today is a wellness coach. So I support individuals and groups and organisations on, on general well-being and then throw in a few other things as well. Great. The secret sauce. The secret sauce, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So shall we talk first of all about setting intentions and... How do we do that? Okay, so I think when we're talking about setting intentions, it's basically being intentional because in life, everybody's really busy. And it's that idea that you're on that hamster wheel and you're just going on in life. And I often find that, uh, you know, clients will come and see me in their 40s and 50s because suddenly they're like, whoa, you know, this is not the life that I want. And that just shows you that basically it's very easy just to be on that sort of treadmill of life and just go with the flow, you know, wake up, go to work, come home, et cetera, et cetera. And before you know it, your life, you know, a lot of your life is behind you. So it's really important to be intentional because then you're trying to reverse the normal routine. You're going against it. So in order to do that, in order to break habits, which is really easy, you have to be intentional you have to step outside that comfort zone. So it's about saying it out loud, setting that intention. You know, it depends what you believe, putting it out to the universe, whatever, to your friends, etc. Because often in just saying it, you're part way there. And that also connects to um, the idea about our beliefs, our thoughts and our actions. And the fact that we, it's probably one of the only things we can control in life are those things but you have to work on them. So setting the intention is part of changing your beliefs. Interesting. So when you have people come and see you, is it because they feel like they've lost control a bit and life is happening to them yeah. rather than the other way around? Yes, yeah, so it's like they're not in control. They're no longer the driver of life. Other factors are governing them. You know, expectations from family, work, this is what you do. So the idea of being intentional is suddenly saying, OK, I'm going to drive my car now. This is what I want with my life. So it involves a lot of work because you've got to think about, well, what is it that I want? What's going to make me happy? So then what is it that I need to change and what intention do I need to put out there to start that change, to get those new habits and those things that will make us feel happier? And you talk about saying it but do you also work quite a lot with visualization? That's oh, something that I've read quite a lot about. I love visualizations. And also, you know, in terms of exercise and sports and, and running, visualization is very, very important. Because when you're working with your subconscious mind, your subconscious mind does not know that that's not real. So if you visualize yourself walking every day at Corora or whatever, your mind already thinks that you've done it. So then it's going to be even easier for you to go and do it because you're already part way there. So you're basically setting yourself up for success. So visualization is one of the most powerful things ever. Visualizing what you want and, and seeing it and then going through. So when you visualize it to make it powerful, you think about what is it I can see? What is it I can hear? And what do I feel as a consequence? So you're really creating that idea in your mind and setting yourself up for success. Amazing. And do you find that quite often people are a bit skeptical about these? They are, but then they try it. And I think 99% of the time it works. I did have one client I did a visualization with and he was like, no, nope, no, nope, not that seeing it. No, 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 no. But then that's fine because you have a, a toolkit and you can also do like a, if you're say thinking about how I want my future to look with no ifs, no buts. You can do the visualization, but for those people who aren't visual, you can also do it as a kinesthetic activity. So you get them to walk. So this is now November, walk to next year. What do you see, hear and feel? So there's ways around it because we all, you know, we all have different ways of seeing things visually, auditory, kinesthetically, and then mixture. 
Okay, really interesting. So just going back to how we're all a bit different and we'll, we we'll react. <laughs> we're all a bit different. Differently <laughs> to different triggers. I remember going for a hypnotherapy session and thinking, this is not going to work. And then it did and it was absolutely astonishing and amazing. So sometimes I think with, with these new tools in life, you have to suspend your skepticism a little bit and just try and see what happens. Intention is about driving your own car. And I think I know as a woman in her 40s that I've also gone through quite a lot of questioning, okay, is this where I want to be? And maybe I'm halfway through life now. What do I want the second half of life to look like? A lot of us struggle with work-life balance, I think. And um, I'm interested to know you know, how you see that and why it's become something that we all struggle with. I think because we've just got more busier, haven't we? There's just more expectation now uh, to be the perfect mom, the perfect woman. You know, talking from a female perspective, that idea of having it all. You know, and the thing is, I think with social media, then that becomes proliferated because you potentially see people who look like, you know, their, their Insta life look like they were able to handle it all. But the thing is, we're not able to handle everything. And so I think that's why it's become more important to talk about work-life balance, because we can't do it all. And it's actually a myth in terms of your life is never going to be balanced. How I see it is you're juggling lots of balls in life where you've got lots of sections. So if I even look at my own life, there will be times when I am more busy with work. So I can't sustain being more busy with work and being the hands-on mom that I want to be. So you have to also give yourself grace and say, okay, overall, I'm getting this right. But at this period of my life, I know I'm working harder, so this is gonna to have to slip. So we have to be realistic. You have to be kind and compassionate to yourself. You're not always gonna have the energy to do all those things. So I see it as a constant, you know, like a seesaw. And also you think about at this point, because for me, it's, and I'm sure everybody else, you know, we're going up to the festive season. So everybody is very busy at the moment trying to finish everything off so that they can have that time off um, in the festive season. So then you know that your life is going to be busy in terms of work. So maybe you're not going to be doing as much exercise or being with your children as much as possible. But that's OK. It's about looking at it holistically. So rather than thinking, oh, this week, this month, it's stepping back and going, well, how is it over this quarter? How am I balancing things? How do I need to adjust them? Because as we know, life keeps throwing us things. So we can't keep always having, you know, everything an even call. It's constantly changing and we just have to be kind and realize that. Definitely. I've heard myself say sometimes when I'm asked about work-life balance, I don't really believe in balance. It's just complete chaos. And I know that's an unhealthy response. I think it comes from a, it probably comes from a defense mechanism of mine. Like how, how, how could you possibly ask me about balance? I'm working, I'm a mom, nothing's, per everything's imperfect, right? Which is I think how a lot of us feel all the time. And, and like you say, it's coming from social media and it's coming from, I think it might be also coming from that feminism is relatively new and this idea that women work as long hours or as hard as men, but we still have other loads that we carry. Not in every relationship, but a lot that I know of, um, there are layers that women are carrying and the men's layers are less, it seems. So I think it's really an interesting question. And, and do you find that you're having to coach more women through this? Or do you have men and women? I think it's both really. Um, because also I work with companies and it's interesting because I'll, I'll go in and I'll be working and, and maybe the brief is something to do with work. But generally, it always comes back to work-life balance because I think that work-life balance is probably the key to mental health, mental wellness, being happy. But obviously, as I said, it's not like it's going to be like this, but this overall looking back and is it fairly balanced? So I think definitely for both genders. And I think it's because also if we go perhaps looking at the male and obviously in a way it's kind of stereotyping, but perhaps men are becoming more prominent in terms of the father figure. So in terms of that whole 
you know, if we looked at pre previous generations, perhaps the children, it was just the mom and the, and the dads were hands off. But I know like in my circles and when I see people, you also see that men are becoming more hands on as parents and in that family setup. So then you can see then suddenly there's this extra factor as well as work. So I think, but I just think in life, we're just busy. There's more expectation to do, to be successful. A mantra that I always think about is, we talk about being busy, but what about being unbusy? So how do we talk about unbusy? How should we incorporate that into our lives? I think a nice way of looking at, as, at it is you have a diary. So your diary is always about filling your diary, isn't it? Yes. Or, you know, whatever. So I always um, say, also, plan for white space in your diary. So plan in between those meetings. Why do we have to have back-to-back -back meetings? Mm. So plan in the white space in your diary. I do it a lot. In my diary, you'll see I'll just have wellness days. I'll just block it out. It could be just maybe doing work admin or whatever, but I block it out so that people can't book my time. But also I know in my head, when I'm looking at it, that I can't slot somebody in. So it's being proactive, it's being intentional. So be intentionally unbusy. Do not feel like you have to fill every moment of your diary, you know, attend every social function, you know, do everything. I conscious, consciously have weekends that are unbusy. I love that. <laughs> yeah, and, and allowing the children to see you like that too, yes. I think, when you are in a family setting, that not everything is planned and uh, as a mother, I'm not here to entertain you 24 seven. You actually have to learn to entertain yourself and be bored. And the other day I was thinking about it. For some reason I didn't have my phone on me, which is wonderful. And I was thinking, I spent a lot of my childhood staring out of the window, thinking or watching clouds or something. And I don't do that anymore. And, you know, maybe, I should every now and then just lie under a tree and watch the clouds skate over the sky. Yeah, and that is, I mean, if we're going to give it the correct term, that's a form of meditation. That's a form of mindfulness, which is also a very big thing now because research, I mean, we know it anyway, but research is clearly backing it up. And I know, for example, in the, in the UK, doctors are recommending their patients to do uh, mindfulness courses because they are finding that it makes a significant difference in certain issues, but for your general mental well-being. And you using that example of uh, cloud gazing, etc., that is a form of mindfulness because mindfulness is concentrating on something intentionally. It's, it's being in the moment and it's giving you yourself that pause. And when you pause, when you go back to life, then you feel more energized. So doing things like that, they can seem like weird or silly, but doing things like that actually make a difference, even for five minutes. I mean, when I do my corporate events, I often get people to take their shoes off and we walk in the grass. Oh, lovely. So it's really thinking about what did you do as a child? Because children know. And then as an adult, we forget that a lot of those things are things that can help us to feel better, like dancing, being in the moment, laughing, laughter yoga. All those things that we did as a child, you know, randomly scribbling, drawing, they're things that actually restore you. So, you know, sometimes we need to look to our children. And when we're parents, there's a gift there because sometimes they pull you into their world and you can't help being more childlike and being more in the moment because they demand so much of you. You can't not be in the moment. Exactly. You have to be there with them, which is actually, as you say, completely wonderful. Um, and so... When it comes to mindfulness, Michelle, because there are meditation apps, um, there are lots of people talking about it, like you say, and I think there's this impression that you should take yourself away and sit down and with your legs crossed and your hands like this on your knees and go on and find some deep inner peace. And my experience has been, oh, this is really hard to fit into my day. And I've come to a more relaxed approach, I think, where staring out of the window is good enough. But how do you recommend that people incorporate a little bit more mindfulness? I mean, there's many ways that you can do it, but I think the great one is, uh, so whatever you're doing, even a shower. Okay, so you have your shower and I'm sure you're in your shower and you're just thinking, right, I've got to do this, send this email, da, 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 da. have I done this? What are we eating tonight? 
But just take five minutes to be mindful. And that mindfulness will be, what do I see in the shower? So the water. And what am I hearing? How does it make me feel? So every experience we can have and be mindful. I mean, it's okay to walk in the forest and, and, and be on your phone. Yeah. But really what you want to do is you want to do it mindfully. So you want to put that phone away and you just want to walk. And as I said, you just go into your body, into your senses. So you just, as I said, it's called BAQ, visual, auditory, kinesthetic. So as you go, put your phone away and just be in the moment. What are the things that I'm seeing in the forest? What are the things I'm hearing? How do I feel? So that's a very, every experience can be that. And in fact, when you're stressed, one of the greatest ways to activate your parasympathetic system and, and be more calm is to go into your senses and to just think, OK, how do my feet feel in my shoes? How does this texture feel? But there's so many ways. I mean, a very famous one is called Rain by Tara Brach, who's like the guru of mindfulness. And it's very simple. Recognize the emotion that you're feeling. You acknowledge it. So I feel sad. I acknowledge it, you know, my sadness, that's OK. I investigate. How's that coming up for me? Oh, I feel it in my stomach. N, nurture. What is my body telling me that I need? I need some time to myself. I need connection. So there's many, many simple ways of bringing it into your life. And I think that's really interesting, the where am I feeling it? Because we also, as adults, get so busy that we forget to feel, I think, sometimes. Whereas the children are immediately into feelings. And we need to, I suppose, recognize the, what they're doing and then take those tools and bring them into our own lives um, and not lose touch with that very primal being that lives within us. And model it as well. Because, you know, we're teaching our children. So also saying, OK, I'm feeling a bit angry now. <laughs> I'm going to take 10 minutes. This is my teenager. I can't have this conversation with you at this minute. I'm going to take some time out. <laughs> when I've calmed down, taken some breaths, gone for a walk, whatever, we can talk about it. But model it, because then what are you sending to them? That it's OK to feel angry, sad, whatever. Yeah. I'm owning it. I've labelled it. And the more we label it, the better it is. Name it to tame it. So the problem is if we repress our emotions, then they just come out later worse, like a, we erupt, we have burnout or whatever. So every day, regularly, we should be tapping in and going, OK, what am I feeling now? Where am I feeling it? It's OK. And then it will pass. If we squash, 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 whew, yeah, it will come out. So thinking about the workplace, we're obviously sitting in the green screen warehouse, even though it doesn't look like a warehouse because we're in the kitchen. But thinking about the workspace, what can we do as employers and as companies to encourage a bit more self-care, mindfulness and recognition of emotion? I think the most powerful thing is being role models. There's no point in just saying, right, you need to have boundaries with your time, you know, start work at this time, finish, not be contacted in the evening, etc. if you yourself are not modelling it. Because like with children, it's what we do that people see, not what we say. So we need to start with modelling ourselves. So showing those healthy boundaries, showing that, um, you know, we're not packing meetings back to back. So it's example and then having wonderful things in place. So in meetings, checking in with everyone's emotions, having meetings that are not just for around business, maybe they're just purely check-in meetings. How are people going today? Let's check in social meetings. So it's really sending that powerful message that you're not just an employee, it's about your whole well-being. And then having initiatives. When I think of companies that I've worked with, there's like one company, I think, maybe once every six weeks, they could take a day off a Friday. Maybe not one, but anyway, a Friday they could take off. And that Friday was about creativity. So they go and do a hobby. So if you, you know, I like music, playing a piano or whatever, but I don't have time. So they were given that time to go and use that time for creativity. 
So it's thinking about things like that. Um, sometimes employees offer vouchers or discounts for gyms and things like that, or bringing in a personal trainer in. You yourself were saying about potentially having a gym area. So making it accessible, maybe allowing them on a certain day, there's a flexi day where they can go to the gym early and coming later. Because I think especially COVID has probably taught us we don't really need to have a nine to five day. So I think that it's really important to have that flexibility. So knowing that the employee will produce whatever they have to produce, but giving them that flexibility. So as long as they produce it, then it's OK if, I don't know, they start at 10 or whatever. So also flexi hours can help because then you can do that walk. So that's what I do. That's why I keep talking about Karura. Every day I go for a walk in Karura. If I'm busy, it might be a 10 minute walk. If I'm not, it's an hour, but I do it every day and it makes a difference. So that's where an intention has turned into a habit. Yes. So to make the habit, because we're breaking an old habit, we have to set the intention and we have to start it because actually starting is the hardest thing. Because once you start it, you realise, oh, I do feel better. And then the habit and the rule is um, 21 days becomes a habit, 21 to 30 days. So you're actually rewiring your brain becomes a habit. Three months of lifestyle. There we go. I think one of the hardest things with wellness, Michelle, what I, how I feel, and this is again, blaming social media a little bit, is that there seem to be so many things I should be doing in order to have a, a good life. How do you advise people start? What are the most important things to start with? I think, that the way to do it is to think about micro self-care. In the ideal world, yes, we'd go to the gym for an hour and we'd go to the spa every weekend and whatever, but that's not really gonna happen. So the most important thing is to start. So I started doing micro self-care when my children were young, because I'd had this wonderful routine before they were born, and then there was no way <laughs> that I was able to do it. So I started doing micro. So for example, I mean, YouTube is a fantastic resource. So, and I love yoga with Adrian. Mm -hmm. So she's amazing and she does five minute, 10 minute, hour, whatever, stress, anxiety, sadness, you name it, she does it. And so that's what I was doing. So five days a week, I was doing one of her videos or her meditations. So I think that's a really important thing just to think about, well, I'd like to do an hour and 20, but what can I do? And whatever you can do is better than nothing. And you know, it's that habit. So even if it's five minutes a day, maybe your expectation is I'm gonna do it 20 minutes, half an hour. Fine, you do it half an hour, but it's okay sometimes if you just have to do it for five or 10 minutes. But you know, then when you're quiet at a quieter period, maybe you'll do it for an hour. So again, it's stepping back and thinking, I can't do an hour every day, but I'm gonna try for 45 minutes. And then sometimes giving myself grace. So not beating myself up because I didn't do that 45 minutes. So I think it's always about being compassionate to yourself. Mm, I love the idea of grace as well and just giving yourself that space to ease into a new habit or a new intention rather than to think, I have to change my whole life. Oh yes. Because yeah. I am, I'm going into wellness now. So <laughs> I can't do this, I can't do this. But also it's thinking about it's a lifestyle. And I remember a nutritionist friend said to me, it's the 80-20 rule. So yes, some people might be 100% full on everything, but realistically, 80-20 is more realistic. So yes, maybe, for example, alcohol, maybe you're, you know, you're not drinking alcohol in the week, but maybe you're having a couple of glasses at the weekend or, you know, an occasion you're having more. But it's that balance because you want to make it work and you don't want to set yourself up for failure. So you have to be realistic, otherwise you'll fail. I'm going to the gym every day. You've failed before you've even started. started yes. I'm going to the gym three times and it's okay if I go four or five. So you have to make it smart, small, measurable, achievable, realistic and target bound. Smart. Okay, I like that. Uh, there's smart, there's rain. There's so many acronyms, <laughs> we're going to throw them at you. <laughs> okay, we, we should have them all on the wall here. <laughs> Um, and I think also the other thing that is quite interesting around habit building, intention setting, is the environment around you and how to set yourself up for success. Like you're saying, um, you organize your diary around wellness days and a bit of white space between meetings. Is there also something around physical environment that can help trigger one's habits or...? Yeah, I mean... I think one of the classic things is decluttering. 
Decluttering is very cathartic. I'm sure we're all there where you get lost in it. But generally trying to have a more tidier space. So I'm quite, you know, I'm quite messy, but I find that if I've got to do some serious work, I have to clear my space. So trying as much as possible to have a pleasant environment. So like I've started buying myself flowers weekly when I do my car for shop. So just little things like that so that you're happy to be in your environment because all these things add to the positivity. And I also want to expand the environment to not just the physical environment, but who you surround yourself with. So you should think about who are the five closest people to you and are they positive influencers? Are they cheerleaders for you? Are they people you can say no to? Are you surrounding yourself with the people who are going to support you and lift you up? Or are you with drainers? And, you know, in adulting, we have to look at that and then make a choice. Because also you are the sum total of those five closest people to you. So is that who you want to be? So environment is not just physical. It's also who you're with, positive vibes, those WhatsApp groups, are they positive energy or are they sapping you? Are they negative? Are they gossipy? So you also have to be mindful of what you're putting into your brain because that also influences you as well. And that's what we're all suffering from a bit with social media. Absolutely. And I was saying to um, some friends the other day that I remember my dad being really um, astonished when the Iraq war was happening and CNN had it on the TV, but you could turn on the TV when you wanted to. And in the same way, we can go to social media when we want to, but you're not sure what you're going to see. And I think this um, Israel-Palestine conflict has been really interesting and quite difficult because there's no choice around one minute I'm looking at a cooking video and the next minute I'm seeing something completely harrowing. And I think there's, we have to be really aware of what we're opening when we open social media now. We do. And to be ready for this huge maelstrom of emotion that could come up from what you see. Yeah, and then it's also, I mean, the ideal rule, but I don't know who actually sticks to it, is two hours before you go to sleep, you switch off your phone. But I think nowadays you, it's not that necessarily realistic. But it is that idea of you want positive vibes before you sleep. So then it's thinking about an hour, 45 minutes, half an hour, whatever, switching it off and maybe tapping into a positive podcast, a guided meditation to help you sleep, whatever, because we can still choose. You just don't go onto those platforms where. <laughs> and also be intentional, have positive groups. I have a gratitude group. Amazing. And that, yeah, it started during Corona. So I know on that group, it's only ever going to be. So how does that work? Talk us through that, because maybe a few people during the festive period will set up so, a gratitude group. One of the, again, a very fundamental part of being positive and, and, and mentally well is positivity, because our brain is geared to be negative, because it's looking out for danger, so then looking towards the negative. So we can rewire our brain, and the quickest and easiest way is to practice gratitude. There's many different ways that you can do it. So I just sort of called out to my friends and said, anybody want to do a gratitude group with me? And we started off by following different challenges. So we can also use social media to the good. I love 30 day challenges. And as I said, after 30 days, it's a habit. So I started off with a simple 30 day gratitude challenge. So it might be like day one, a person you're grateful for, day two, a person of food. So you are intentionally working your mindfulness muscle. And the thing is, the more you develop it, because if I say to you, what are you grateful for? Generally, people will say my family, and there's nothing wrong with that, but that's, we want to also explore that muscle more because there's so many other things that you can be grateful for as well, not negating those. So when you do like a challenge, you're really honing that gratitude and muscle. That then means that any situation that you're in, it's going to be easier for you to see the silver lining, to think about what's the opportunity, what is the universe or whatever you believe, what is the lesson I need to learn. So actually, I'd say, that is really important. I talk about, I call it vitamin G. Vitamin we top up our vitamin D with sun and whatever, but we really need to keep topping up our vitamin G. So it's easy. You can start off by just three things in the morning that you're grateful for, three in the evening. You can do a 30 day challenge. You start a group with your friends where it's just literally, we call it glimmers now as well, because we have triggers, we have glimmers. 
So now we just free flow. So people just literally share. I think there's probably 30 people on the group. They just share, not every day, but they share. Today I'm grateful for, this is my glimmer. And then that, that helps other people because then I see your sharing reminds me. So again, I just have some positive groups. I also have a cake and business group, which is just a group of ladies that I've handpicked are on the same page as me. And um, we're just in that very supportive, positive group. So I know also on, in that group, it's just positivity. So it's really about being intentional about who you hang out with, the groups you interact with, and just and, and topping up that vitamin G. Great, I love it. And do you think, Michelle, like through all the experience that you've had as a wellness coach and in life, um, that there are some people who are just naturally wired to be more silver lining people and some people who are just wired to be a bit more dark cloud kind of people. Yeah, yeah, there is. And that can be personality and it can also be experience as well. Because some people, most awfulest situations, I mean, you read about them and they can still be positive. But practices like gratitude and those things, you can rewire your brain. So I think you can never say, well, I, I can never be positive, it's not me. You can, but again, it's being intentional and doing certain habits and doing certain things that, that will build that positivity muscle. And I think there's something a bit reductionist about saying I'm wired that way. Whereas I love the way you speak about a muscle because then you can definitely see how if you put the work in, you'll get a result. We talk about that when if strength training that I was talking about earlier. Um, and so, it, you know, I love thinking about the brain more as a muscle than something you, you've been born with and it's grown, you know, early childhood was obviously very important for um, our, our brains and development. But just knowing that later on in life, you have a choice. You do, because neuroscience now, there's a lot of research out there, and it's basically our brain is like Play-Doh. So we can totally manipulate it in how we want it. And as I said, you do those 30 days and you've actually rewired your brains. New synapses, new neuron connections. connections. So yes, you, are, you really are the master or mistress of your own life. Great. I love that. So any last tips? I love, I love the idea of a positivity group. I'm going to be giving that a go. I hope everybody will give that a go. And this is such a good time because you're going to see friends and family over the festive period, hopefully. It's a good time to say, I don't want to do this as a kind of, I'm so great, but more as a kind of, let's build this muscle together um, group, positivity group um, and vitamin G. Is there anything else, Michelle, sort of parting thoughts and words that you'd like to leave us with? I just think that um, we go to the gym, as you said, so using your analogy. So it's the idea that our mental wellness is the same. A person can be positive, but you do need to work at it. And I think also to realise that everybody has challenges, but a positive person recognises that, but they realise that tomorrow will be a better day. Thank you so much. Thanks, Michelle. That's fine. It's fun. I like doing these things. <laughs> Thanks so much for listening. And if you've been inspired by this episode, please spread the love. Click on the share button and send it on WhatsApp to a friend you know would enjoy it too. Or do all the usual sharing and liking on social media. It makes a massive difference to us and we're super grateful.